Well, thank you, uh, Zena, for the introduction, and thank you to Gary and the ANSOG team for inviting me to speak this afternoon. As it's uh, late in the day, I thought I'd try and make my remarks a little bit light-hearted from time to time. And to begin, if we're looking at the politics of government in most Western democracies, and you can say this certainly about Australia, you can certainly say it about the United States, at the moment, politics is not really characterised by nuance and subtlety. <laughs> we look at the United States in particular. Often the word most frequently used, as it was during our recent election campaign, is the word lies. Now, how to deal with a lie. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter, then challenged by Governor Ronald Reagan, gave an interview to an American magazine where he talked about his working day in terms similar to Michelle and, uh, and to Tom. And his working day, according to the President of the United States, began every morning with a cold shower. Now, at the next campaign press conference, Governor Reagan was asked for his response. And Reagan thought for a moment, and he had this habit of dropping his chin to one side and he said, um, any man who tells you he enjoys a cold shower first thing in the morning will lie about other things. <laughs> <laughs> now that attacked Carter's credibility directly but with great subtlety and good humour. And it's remarks like that that turn political campaigns around. But I'll pick up where Tom and Michelle left off in one sense. How has political life changed in our democracies the last half century or so? Well, in all kinds of ways, but I illustrate this with a story that Gore Vidal used to tell about the 1960 US election. Vidal ran for the Democratic Party for a congressional seat in upstate New York. He fell out with Bobby Kennedy because he used to be fond of reminding RFK that he had actually polled better than the presidential ticket in this particular district. Nonetheless, he was very fond of Jack Kennedy. And he recalled an occasion in which the president said to him, how was it that the founders of the American Republic were so brilliantly informed, were so eloquent was so knowledgeable. And when you think about Madison and Jefferson and Monroe, Franklin and the like, he was absolutely correct. And Vidal said, well, if you look at the founding years of the Republic, the leadership went home for the winter and they read books, they wrote letters, they thought about the issues. And that, of course, is the great change that's occurred and accelerated over more recent times, this denial of political leadership a chance to think an issue through. Now we do work in the 724-365 media cyclone and it is remorseless and it is voracious. Immediate responses to issues are required, even issues that will burn out in a matter of hours. In Certain governments, there have been ministerial staffers dedicated solely to responding to letters and inquiries from schlock jocks. That's the point that we've reached. Now, the pressures can be relentless, it's true, particularly where social media is concerned. And the Turkish coup to which Michelle drew attention is a classic case where social media reports on the issues and developments much faster than, say, the Australian ambassador to Ankara, who is a, a, a very good uh, diplomat, by the way, can report to the foreign minister. But it's a case of fitting the social media coverage and fitting the politics of the cyclone into the politics of statecraft. It's impossible to slow the cyclone down, but there are some remedial steps which do provide possible solutions. 
And what I'm going to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is we should look a configura at a configuration of government, certainly at a configuration of politics, that's based on the American NFL football team. And that is, as with your lawyers, my lawyers always comprise two sets. There's an offensive set and there's a defensive set. And what's more, you have kickers and punters who come in at the end either to score points after a touchdown or to put the ball well downfield to give you some space. It's not possible to have a ministry, a parliamentary or political party or bureaucratic advisors, governmental advisors who can deal with all of the incoming on a daily basis and still stay focused. So what I'm arguing for is in government, like the NFL, we should have a strategic team, a team of strategists who think about where government needs to be 12 months, three years, five years ahead and to stay focused. As well, we need a set of tactical players who are looking at the maelstrom of what's happening day to day, who are looking about a week or two ahead, are endeavouring to keep the issues within reach of government by way of response so that they don't simply run away and to have people whose job when a little bit of calm air is reached to convert what's been said, what's been stated into more meaningful policy, that is to put some extra points on the board. The strategists should seek to set an issue in a perspective after working it through over time and be open about that and be very open that this will take time. I'll give an example, it's probably the longest running inquiry in a Western democracy of recent times. And it's possible to criticise the Chilcot inquiry on uh, British intervention in Iraq for taking far too long, seven years. I'd certainly be critical of it. But does anyone doubt that that is going to be the final word on Britain and Iraq? On why Britain intervened, where the flaws and failures were and what has to be avoided for the future? And so I think on that basis, it's possible to argue that it's really necessary for government to create an overarching strategy. One of the uh, classic examples has occurred just recently. You know, I thought the Prime Minister's decision to appoint a Royal Commission into juvenile detention in the Northern Territory was a good decision. But it's come apart because it hasn't fit underneath an overarching strategy at federal, state and territorial level. What is the Royal Commission expected to achieve in terms of enduring policy terms? That's what really needed to be thought through. Certainly announce the Royal Commission, but then come back with broader terms of reference that can go through a COAG, that can be agreed on a federal and state basis, and a lot of the problems that have arisen subsequently would simply not have arisen. In other words, look squarely at the policy outcomes. I can recall while I was in the Senate, Paul Keating being roundly attacked for drawing attention to a headline in the Australian Financial Review. So this is back in the 90s, so we're talking essentially 20 plus years ago. And Keating took a great deal of pride in a Fin Review headline that talked about the year 2020 and how by that stage there'd be $2 trillion in Australian pension and superannuation funds. And what an extraordinary achievement for the country that would be. And the critics were everywhere. Why aren't you building this bridge? Why aren't you building this highway? Why aren't you spending more money on social security? Ed Keating was looking 20, 25 years ahead. And of course, as everyone now knows, he was proved absolutely right. And from time to time, it really is necessary within political leadership to be prepared to look that far ahead. Frankly, it simply works. The problem that we have in the main in terms of crafting policy 
creating imaginative uh, policy is that the parties virtually do none of it now. That's as much a reflection on my own party as it is on the uh, coalition. Now it is possible to look to the think tanks for some of the response. It is possible to look at global imperatives and global influences for analysis. But we have a situation in which policy making, which was once so important in our politics, has been relegated almost to an afterthought because we're simply dealing with the day to day and putting aside the important, not only for the urgent, but for the immediate. That's why I think the argument for strategists, for tacticians and for converters works. I ask everyone here this question because I ask it myself. Why on earth do we persist with these nonsensical identifications in our politics now of left and right? It was fine for the French National Assembly in 1791 and it worked all the way through to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Now it's almost meaningless. Classic example of that, I won't start talking about Donald Trump, but Trump is an example of it. The President of the United States was right when he talked about the Republican Convention in Cleveland being neither Republican nor Conservative. <coughs> but look at Brexit and look at the mix of players there, look at the mix of philosophical tendencies there and look more so at Europe. Populism is dominant. The political class is very largely discredited and is often despised. And the, uh, the old identifications of left and right mean very little. Now our politics, ladies and gentlemen, I'd argue, ought to be divided into fantasists and realists. <laughs> fantasists in our politics believe in closing Sydney Airport while refusing to build Badgerys Creek. And that's a real position of one of the, uh, uh, the parties. The classic example in Australian government would be James Ford Cairns. And Chris Bowen has an excellent chapter in his book, The Money Men, about Cairns refusing to take the Treasury in 1974 until Gough Whitlam said, well, if you're not going to take it as a deputy leader, Lionel Bowen will. And obliging a fantasist to step into a real position. And he only lasted a few months as a consequence of that. It is a great example. Now, where fantasists are concerned, it's always necessary for the process to test. To test, as Gorbachev and Reagan used to say to each other, trust but verify, to test. Now, what's the best story I can tell you about that? It's a military story. It's about a newly elevated senior figure in the Australian Defence Force who is sent off to Beijing to meet his counterparts. And there is something of a tradition in this meeting where the Chinese hosts take the newly promoted Australian military leader to a restaurant which of course specialises in Peking duck. And the Australian ambassador tells the new arrival, of course, you understand how this tradition works. You'll be served a lavish banquet meal and at the end of it, the chef will come out of the kitchen and he'll have a tray and it will have the number of ducks in the meal represented by duck heads on the tray. It could be four, it could be six, it could be 10 or 12. And of course you are expected to eat some of these duck heads to show your appreciation. So, <clears throat> conference is held. The Chinese host says to the Australian visitor, come and share my car, we're going across to the restaurant now for dinner. So in the car in the back seat as they're travelling across Beijing in the evening traffic, the Chinese host says, now you know about our, uh, our traditional dinner and this restaurant specialises in Peking duck. And the Australian said, yes, I've, I've heard all about it. Our ambassador's briefed me. The Chinese <clears throat> general said, well, that's really good. He said, but for goodness sake, don't do what the last fool of an Australian admiral here did and eat the duck heads at the end of the meal. <laughs> The ambassador, of course, had been sending his military <laughs> guest up. So trust, test, <laughs> believe me, it's important. Now, one thing that tends to escape us these days because our politics have become so embittered 
and so intensely partisan, often over very, very small issues, is that the political class has forgotten that the electorate actually likes, welcomes and respects a degree of bipartisanship, a degree of reaching out across the aisle. And of course, there's still a, a good deal of bipartisanship in our political process, it's just that the public never sees it. But that's how parliamentary committees work, that's how most legislation is decided, and there are all kinds of quite civilised arrangements across the aisle. But making it more obvious, more transparent, more public works, as well as not being afraid to compromise. It's not necessary to have a 100% result every time. Margaret Thatcher used to be fond of saying that some battles were so important they had to be fought more than once. That was because she recognised she couldn't win every time. Ronald Reagan was fond of saying in dealings with the Congress when Tip O'Neill was Speaker, if we can get 80% of the loaf, that's fine. We'll accept that and at some stage in the future we'll come back for more. The art of compromise works still. What can we do to make our governments work better? There are a number of steps we could take. In Australia, we could extend the term of the House of Representatives from three to four years and the Senate from six to eight years. It would give governments more room in which to manoeuvre, more room in which to develop policy, and there would be less pressure as a consequence of having to react not only to the media cyclone, but to the dead hand of the electoral pressure that's inherent in a three-year uh, parliament. It would result in better government. We could look at a threshold quota in the Australian Senate. The German system of 5% recommends itself to me. We're about to see a Senate that res resembles the bar room in the first Star Wars. <laughs> the <coughs> I wish I didn't have to say that, believe me. And we could look at intelligent arrangements on major policy issues between the parties. I'm talking Labor and the Coalition here. The Salisbury Convention has worked in the United Kingdom since 1945. <coughs> Both parties have respected the Convention, which simply says this. If the incoming government has published a manifesto, taken that manifesto to the people, and it contains certain items which are the subject of legislation, or are to be the subject of legislation, the Lords will not oppose. Now think that would, what that would mean in our politics if we had that arrangement between the major parties in the Senate. At one stroke, you would marginalise people who should be marginalised. So the future of the country is not left in the hands of Hanson and Hanson Young. That's a sensible step that's readily, readily embraced. It's not necessary to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> I also think there's a great lack of humour in our politics and it's possible to disarm some of the critics out there in the cyclone with just a little humour. This story was told to me by an American diplomat in Beijing. I was at a security conference with him a couple of years ago and he'd had the misfortune, or perhaps the good luck, to be assigned to look after the North Korean delegation to the United Nations in New York. And at <laughs> one stage, the North Korean ambassador was granted approval to go on a speaking tour of the United States. First engagement was in Atlanta, Georgia. And quite a, uh, quite a well-attended dinner, 250 people in a major hotel ballroom came to listen to the North Korean ambassador. So, how does the ambassador disarm his audience, who were naturally hardly sympathetic to his political position? Indeed, a lot of them were quite hostile. So he stood up and he began by asking a couple of questions and he said, um, can uh, anyone tell me what my favourite movie might be? And there's dead silence. He said, well, it's gone with the wind. And there was a hush in the Atlanta audience. And he said, can you tell me, ladies and gentlemen, why Gone with the Wind would be my favourite film? Again, there's dead silence. And the ambassador leaned forward and he said, because in that movie, the North won. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the response from his American audience. So he had them in his hand. 
from that point on. Uh, Humour is very valuable to government, it's very valuable in politics. I always think <coughs> timing is important, follow through is important in policy terms, reaffirmation is important in policy terms, looking at the practical impact of policies in the kitchen, in the dining room, in the neighbourhood, be they in the great regions of Australia or in the cities, and hammering always the law of consequences. That if you do things in government, there are consequences, and even worse, if you fail to do things, there are consequences. I finish on this simple note, that sometimes uh, the fantasists win uh, for a time, then the law of consequences takes over. Look at Boris Johnson the morning after Brexit. Now it's debatable whether Johnson and Gove actually thought they were going to win. Maybe their goal was something entirely different. Maybe they thought Remain would just creep back across the line, but David Cameron, who was their real opponent, would be crippled. However, they won. What did Johnson have to say the next day? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's like the classic scene of Robert Redford as Bill McKay in Michael Ritchie's film The Candidate, where he's just been elected as a United States Senator for California. And as the cheering is erupting outside, he's in the men's room with his campaign director and he turns to him and says, what happens now? <laughs> Logic is like gravity. It does assert itself. So the fantasists can have their day, but always it's a matter of what is left standing after the cyclone has passed. Logic being like uh, gravity means that it can be relied upon absolutely. That's why I think the strategists ultimately prevail. Thanks very much. Thank you.